Good morning and welcome to church. Would you all please stand and turn your hymnals to page 259. We'll sing the first and the fourth verse. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Good morning. Good to see everybody out here this morning. A um, couple announcements are here prayer list before we start with prayer. I have salvation on here. We're praying for uh, a couple gentlemen for salvation, Mike and Arlo. If uh, you know if there's other people we want to add to the list, uh, we can do first name or just so we need to be praying for people to understand and, on, and hear a clear gospel. We're also praying for the Philippines. They had a uh, Muslim terrorist attack in Minandau, where we were at. Uh, they actually killed 44 people at the, um, I guess it was the mall we were at. Killed a law enforcement officer and everything. So Pastor Benjamin emailed me asking for prayer for the people of the Philippines there. They obviously coming under attack. And um, so it's, 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 it's getting real out there. And uh, obviously I definitely think it's close to the rapture, hopefully. Show Campbell had passed. She sat back there in the third pew from the back. And, um, you know, she was a believer. She's absent from the body and present with the Lord. So when we, we're doing her service tomorrow, it's family visitation at 9 a.m. Uh, friends and friends can come at 10 a.m. And we'll have the service at 11 a.m. If you And we'll have a luncheon downstairs. If you can come and help, let Carla know. If you uh, have co cookies and things, that we'll definitely take them. Um, but we will definitely be providing a luncheon downstairs. I know it's Monday, and there's probably a lot of people that cannot come tomorrow, but uh, I just want to thank everybody. I put it down here. Thanks to all who are praying for the service, where uh, the gospel can be clearly given, and pray that uh, people's ears will be opened and get saved possibly tomorrow. That will be the goal. Uh, Emma Rieger, she obviously has a virus. We need to pray for her that it doesn't come under attack that uh, would attack her kidney transplant. So we need to pray for the, that young lady. We have Taylor Cole who had surgery. Big Dan, I saw Big Dan uh, last Sunday at service in uh, over at Majestic Pines. Just played for him for medical. Herman's grandson, Alex, for medical. Rusty's father-in-law, we need to continue to pray for him for medical, I believe it was. Is that right, Rusty? And then John Lake for medical. I think he's got an appointment on the 16th to make sure it's not cancer. Is that correct, Linda? Yeah. So, but then we need to pray for it. At a prayer meeting this week, we had the work environment had come up quite a bit for some people, and we just need to pray for that for people, for all of us. Uh, we do have John Campbell on the list. His son came here last Sunday. 
and Elvina, that's Carlo's mom, Jack and Carlo's mom. And then Bobby Topper, his dad did not have heart surgery because he was had pneumonia, but we just still need to pray for Bobby and Debbie traveling. And Lori Seagull for medical, and then Chris Brown family, and Barb Adams also for medical. Is there any other prayer before? Yes, Karen. What's your granddaughter's name? How old is she? Sure. There's a hill fine there. It will. Any other prayer requests this morning? Yes. I do have him on the list. I didn't mention him. I heard his hospice is not. It's coming to the end. And he is a believer. We need to just pray, 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 pray for peace and comfort. Jess? Who? Yes? Anybody else? Let's open the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, first of all, we're just so thankful that we can gather here in your name, and we're so thankful that we can read the wonderful words of life today, that we can know without a doubt that we're sinners, and we actually deserve hell, but you sent your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for the sins of mankind, to be buried, and he rose again the third day, showing us the payment for sin was paid in full. And when we come to Christ by faith, we come to God by faith through Jesus Christ, we believe in the gospel of salvation, believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. We're born again, eternally sealed, become a son, a daughter, forever in Christ. And Father, we're so thankful for this position that we receive in Christ. It can never be lost. And be, it's just an honor and a glory to sit here today to know that we have eternal life. And Father, as our loved ones, we pray for our loved ones and we pray for our friends and family that are sick and ones that are on hospice. It is just an honor to sit here today like Cheryl Campbell, to know that she's absent from the body and present with the Lord. That other believers, when they, they will see her again, that she's forever in heaven and she's up there happy and the pain-free and forever in, in with, with our heavenly Savior, Jesus Christ, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray for people like Richards, the Richards family. We know Mike is on hospice. We pray for him to be pain-free. We pray for him to be comfortable. And we, we, we too need to be reminded when we pray for Mike, yes, we're praying for a miracle, but Father, that you do heal him and deliver him from this. However, when he does pass, he will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And Father, we just ask that you could give the family comfort for this, give them peace, and let them know that we will see Mike again also. And Father, we pray for the, the people that need salvation, the people that need to hear the wonderful words of life, because we know faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. And we need to be bold and we need to share the gospel of salvation, the gospel of Christ to people. And we pray for people like Mike. We pray for people like Arlo so they hear the gospel and accept the gospel because without the gospel, without believing the gospel, we know their eternity in hell forever. And that's sad that people go to hell with their sins paid for, Father. And Father, we pray for the people of the Philippines. Today we know this leak has been a tragedy to the people of the Philippines. We know there is uh, evil amongst this world and Satanism amongst this world, and, and uh, they are, you know, they, they say in the name of God, but it is in the name of Satan where they go and attack and kill people. And Father, we just pray that you would keep Pastor Benjamin, Aluna, their family, and the people of the Philippines, the people of the Good News Bible Church in the Philippines, we pray that you keep them safe, that you would build a hedge of protection around them. We pray that Pastor Benjamin would be bold still and give the gospel out to people and invite people at the church where they can come hear the clear word of God. But Father, we pray for, for them, that you give them peace and keep them comfortable and ultimately keep them safe. We pray for Amma Rieger that uh, you just continue to work through that young lady and that you would uh, that she would not get the virus that would have to remove the, the kidneys of their father. We just ask that you continue to work through her and deliver her through this. 
pray for Taylor Cole that you keep her comfortable through the surgery, uh, through the healing after the surgery, and we just pray that uh, you bring her back to the church soon. Pray for Big Dan, you keep him safe there, Father. Pray for Alex, uh, Herman's grandson, that uh, whatever the diagnosis, we can figure that out, why he's having seizures there, Father, and that we can get diagnosed this issue and that he can be healed also there, Father. We pray for, for us, his father-in-law, for medical, John Lake. We pray for February 16th that uh, cancer is not the issue. We pray for the work environment for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, that, you know, that we be not like the world, that we not lash out, and that we, you know, that we watch our tongue and we not become backbiters in the office or by the water cooler, but we, but we, we become the light and that people in the workplace can see there's something different about us. Father, we pray for Lori Siegel. We know that uh, she's a believer, stage four, and we just pray that uh, you'd be with her and keep her comfortable and pain-free. We pray for Bobby's, Bobby's dad, that when he has surgery, their father, that uh, you keep him safe. We pray for Bobby and Debbie's safe travels. Pray for Barb Adams for medical. Pray for Dante Laudison for medical. Pray for Chuck Carlson, whom I understand only has a couple weeks to live there, Father. And Father, we pray that um, he would hear the gospel and then believe the gospel. So we pray that you would work in this man's life in the next couple weeks there, Father. Pray for Jim's, Jim's son who's, who had lost his grandma. We pray that at the funeral today that the gospel would be given and people would be saved. We pray for their granddaughter, Jim and Karen's granddaughter, who's 10 year old, Father, that uh, obviously she's an active young lady. We just pray that uh, if you need to slow her down and we just pray that you would heal this young lady. We pray for um, Shelby's daughter, their father, who's having seizures. We just pray that, first of all, that you'd give mom comfort and give mom peace, that you'd remove all anxiety and stress and give her assurance that things are going to be okay. And Father, we just ask that you keep this little girl safe and that you would uh, deliver her from this. And Father, if there's any other prayer requests I might have missed this morning, you know the needs and the wants of the people. We just pray today that, that your word can be uh, delivered to the body, and that we can apply the word of God to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Birthdays this week. I know Fred's birthday's on Tuesday. Wait a minute, Michelle. Looks like you got a birthday. Oh, there she is. She's hiding. Anna's, yeah. Today? Friday? This coming Friday? She's older than you? <laughs> I won't ask how old she is. Oh, Ann Weiser. Are there any, any more? I don't see any hands. We'll sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And anniversaries? Alan Shirley, 46 years. Alan Shirley, 46 years? Congratulations. Did we have any others? No? We'll sing. Happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, celebrating merrily our happy anniversary, celebrating merrily your happy anniversary, and God bless you. We'll turn over to page 607. And we will sing all three verses. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me I will follow. Where he leads me I will follow. Where he leads me I will follow. Go with him with him all the way. 
judgment. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. He will give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory and go with me with me all the way where he leads me I will follow where he leads me I will follow where he leads me I will follow I'll go with him with him all the way. Well, would you please turn to page 256. And we'll sing the first and the fourth verse. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I someday for a crown. Quick announcements this morning. We've got Majestic Pines service at 11 a.m. If you want to come join us over there, we'll probably be looking at Philippians this morning, chapter 2. Uh, service again for Shell Campbell tomorrow. You all heard me speak about that. I don't need to repeat myself. Bible study this Wednesday. And at uh, this Wednesday, we'll probably have a youth group meeting after Bible study. 
and we have youth group coming up February 22nd. And Mike did mention to me that I have not said nothing about weeks for Bible camp, so I did put on there, we got 22 weeks until Bible camp. So, and we should be counting down. So it is a good time. And uh, with weather like this, we'll be able to hopefully fire up camp soon. Is there anything we need to announce before the announcements, Aaron? Did you want, did you, you coming up? No? Okay. <laughs> anything else? Chris's kids, huh? How you guys doing? He's back there going out with the... All right, let's do the last song. We need the kids' help for this. If you're taking notes for prayers, I forgot to put on the list. We have three ladies traveling, Chris, Rachel, and Carla. They went out and saw Ray, so we got them traveling today. And we have Ron Hines that's got some tests he's going to get done this week. So please keep Ron in prayer. Oh, I guess I, I should hand this out, I guess. Sorry. We're going to sing I'll Fly Away. If you know it, please join us. Well, then. this one? Good. I think it's cool, isn't it? Let's do this. Let's do this too. Joy will never end. Sounds good. Wonderful. You can hear him. He did awesome today. I finish up uh, Romans chapter 11 this morning. Definitely call the message uh, Grace versus Works 2. Obviously, we continue with Romans 11. Ron was going to bring me some water. That's why I'm kind of delaying this.
but we'll keep going. Romans 11, um, definitely some good stuff in there. And obviously we need to remember when we're talking about the nation Israel and the nation of the Gentiles there. And, uh, and it's uh, really speaking to the nation of Israel. So when we get into it, obviously we'll be repeating myself over and over so people understand that it's not necessarily individuals we're talking about. We're really addressing the nation Israel, the future position of Israel, and basically how the re reconciliation of Israel. First of all, how we, obviously the, the, the Israel nation, obviously uh, uh, rejecting the gospel. And how we then are reconciled. Obviously the Gentiles, the gospel went out to the Gentiles. How we were, we were reconciled by the gospel. And ultimately through our belief, it will one day get the Jews, the Israel nation. It will motivate them. Obviously they will be jealous of uh, what we have with Christ. And that they will want that one day. And then they will be reconciled also. And we'll see this as a Gentile nation and a Jewish nation, Israel nation. But before we start, I want to read verses, uh, verse uh, Romans eleven six, because I love this word verse. And it says, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, we're just so thankful for your grace. You are the God of grace. You're the God of mercy. You're the God of love. And Father, we don't deserve it. We actually deserve hell. We know who we are, but you are the God of grace. You've given us this gift, the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. And Father, if there's anybody here today that's questioning salvation, they want to know what the gospel is. We talk a lot about the gospel here. Father, we just ask that they would understand what the gospel is and what, understand what the gospel is not. Because... To understand the gospel, we really do need to understand what it is not. And we know the gospel is believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for his sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. So, Father, if there's anybody here today that for the first time, we just ask that they would understand that and accept that. And today they could be saved. And today they can know they will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. That Jesus Christ has paid all, all for sin. And we trust in the finished works of Jesus Christ. And Father, to the believers that sit here today, to the, you know, the, the children, the adolescent, and maybe the old man that sits, sits in Christ, you know, the spiritual maturity is different in all of us. And Father, we just ask that you take the word today and feed your sheep. That only the word of God could do that. It could feed all levels of development. So Father, we just ask that you'd feed the sheep here today, feed your children, and that they would continue to grow up in Christ, and that their mind would be continued to be transformed by the word of God. And that is what Philippians 2 is all about, to be like-minded, like Christ. Get our minds off ourselves and on to others. So Father, we just ask that you bless the message today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we go back to Romans 11. 11. He says, I say then, and we talked a lot about the stumbling block. He says, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to pro provoke them to jealousy. It was prophesied that Israel would reject the gospel of Christ. We read that in, in Romans uh, chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. And it was written in Hosea, in 25 and 26, And he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and here beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that the place where it is said unto them, You are not my people, there shall be called the children of the living God. I'm sorry, he uh, Romans 9, 25, 26 is about the Gentiles becoming children, but it also does talk about there how they rejected the gospel. So the gospel was preached unto Israel, yet they rejected it. And I think a good verse for that is Acts. Turn over to Acts chapter 28. Because Paul, he shared the gospel with, the, with uh, the Israelites, the Jews, quite a bit, and he was rejected. Acts 28, 25 through 31. And 
when they agreed not amongst themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, that's grown dull, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning, disputing amongst themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him, prohibiting him. So before we move forward, we need to discuss what is the gospel, because if there's anybody here that's not saved, they need to understand what the gospel is. And I know we have the list, and we'll review the list. And uh, we do this every couple months, every three or four months, and it's been a while, but I think it's important that we look at the list. So what is not the gospel? What is not the gospel? One can never be too clear what is not the gospel of salvation, and this is what is not the gospel. The gospel is not confessing one's sins. The gospel is not getting confirmed. The gospel is not asking Jesus into your heart. The gospel is not surrendering your life to Jesus. The gospel is not stop sinning. The gospel is not feeling sorry for your sin. The gospel is not turning from your sin. The gospel is not walking to the front of the church and giving your life to Jesus. The gospel is not getting water baptized or getting infants baptized. The gospel is not being a member of a certain church or organization. The gospel is not giving money or buying your way to heaven. The gospel is not making Jesus king of your Lord of your life. It's not following the commandments. The gospel is not trying to outweigh the good over the bad. The gospel is not just believing in a God, a higher power. The gospel is not submitting oneself to Jesus. The gospel is not partaking in communion. And you know what? We could probably add to the list. But that's not what the gospel is. Maybe you thought one of those items above was the gospel, but it is not. It is not biblical. If you look what the gospel is, it is 1 Corinthians 15. Please turn over to that. And if you've not understand this, if you've not seen this, I would encourage you to look in the Bible. Somebody show it to somebody. Because it's important that the... If there's anybody here today that is not saved, they see this and understand this. For like Cheryl Campbell, we have no idea, idea when our life is going to end. And if you're here today and you're not saved, I would ask that you would understand this before you leave those doors today because you have no idea if you're going to die today. It doesn't matter what kind of life you've led or living, it's more important that you understand what the gospel is. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 4, 15, verses 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, obviously they're believers already. And the Corinthian church, this is a corrected letter to the church, so obviously their behavior, their conduct in the church was horrible. Horrible. And Lordship Salvation obviously should read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians because these people obviously had uh, uh, very uh, destructive behavior in the church. And he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached, past tense, Unto you which also you have received and wherein you stand. These people are saved. They've already received the gospel. And it's important that we believers understand that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And we're to live by grace through Jesus Christ. These people were not living by grace. By which also you are saved. And if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. Obviously not living by grace. Right there. Verse 3, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel is that we have a living Savior today who sits at the right hand of God. All one has to do to go to heaven is believe the gospel. Believe that he died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day, and you're eternally sealed. That is it. That is that simple. Just like the thief on the cross. Both malefactors, both thieves were, were obviously mocking Jesus Christ, and the one thief got saved. He didn't get down from the cross to get baptized or change his life or commit his life to Christ. He believed right then and there, and, to, and Jesus says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. It happens right now. You can have eternal life right now. You can life can step from death unto life. You can know you are saved. 
Bible is very clear how one gets saved and how one does not. So again, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not a work that any man should boast. We're saved by grace through faith, not saved by yourself. Salvation is a gift freely received in Christ. And I want to emphasize, we did this last week, but it is not your faithfulness that saves you. That would be a work. Look at my faith. I'm trusting in my faith. It is not our faithfulness that saves you because you're trusting yourself. But it is, are you trusting in the finished works of Jesus Christ? And let me quote two verses, John 17, 4 and John 17, John 19, 30. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Obviously, Jesus, obviously the prayer, he's, the, Jesus' prayer, his high priestly prayer there, and ultimately he's telling, he's, he knows he's going to the cross. He's foretelling, and, he's, and he knows he's going to complete this work, the work of G, him dying on the cross for the sins of mankind, and obviously 1930. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he says, it is finished. And it is interesting, we talked in, Bible study Wednesday night, this we're reading, actually, we just had read up to 30. And it comes for, from the Greek word to telestai. To telestai, paid in full. And my understanding is that is to telestai is a perfect tense word. And that means it is finished. It has been completed and it's ongoing to be completed. It's always, will always be done. There will be nothing else ever to do to it is finished. It is complete. It is paid in full, like Dennis said at Bible study. So again, I cannot stress enough that it is not your faith that saves you. It is the object of that, your faith. What are you trusting in? True Christianity, not religion, for religion never saved anyone. True Christianity is a person. It is about Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. For one to be saved, you are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. You believe in the finished works of Jesus Christ. So last week we discussed grace versus works. This week we do the same. It has been a battle since man was created and when will be a battle into the future. Unsaved man preaches works. Religion preaches works for salvation. However, God the Father has given us the wonderful words of life. And he says he is satisfied with his son's death payment. That is why Christ Jesus resurrected. Does so anybody here remember the story of Cain and Abel? Turn over to Genesis chapter 4. Great example of grace versus works. A righteousness received in Christ or religion. Genesis 4, 1 through 5. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. She obviously thought the prophecy of uh, Genesis 3.15 had come true right then and there. So obviously they knew of the coming Messiah. When they slaughtered uh, the, this innocent animal and the, when they covered themselves with fig leaves and God says he's not going to accept, their, they're covering themselves for their sin. Did they recognize they had sin and they tried to cover themselves? A picture of works, the fig leaf religions of the world. He, cried, he crucified, he, he killed, not crucified, but he killed an innocent animal in the garden there and it was because of the blood and he covered him with animal, animal skins. A picture of Christ's righteousness. And obviously they gave prophecy of the Messiah coming. And she had thought that, 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 that when she had Cain, he was the one. Yet he didn't come for like 4,000 years later. And she again bare his brother Abel and Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Cain was the tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. He became very angry. We all know Cain was a murderer. But all in reality, I'll tell you, Cain was a religious man. For he offered fruits of his labor. And what did God say about this religious man? 
Turn all the way over to 1 John because he gives us the answer. Just before Jude. So the battle of works versus grace has started right from Cain and, A Cain and Abel. And it goes today and it will continue to be the battle thereof. First John 3.12. He says, not as Cain who was of that wicked one. Obviously he was lost. And slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. He wanted to have a righteousness. He wanted to show how righteous he was. But ultimately... Religion can never make you righteous. The law just shows you how big of a sinner you really are. What did God say about Abel? Turn a couple books back to Hebrews. Chapter 11. Verse 4. By faith. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Obviously, his, his testimony still speaks today that this man, Cain, Abel, I'm sorry, believed in the coming Messiah. Uh, coming Messiah. Abel offered a bloody sacrifice. He believed in the coming lamb who would die a bloody sacrifice for the sins of the world. And Abel was a believer and he was considered righteous. The righteousness we receive is in Christ Jesus. Abel was considered righteous by his faith in Christ Jesus. Remember, if Cain was religious, he was not righteous. Grace versus works has been the battle that is the battle today and will be the battle tomorrow. And let me be clear, you are a sinner, deserve hell. For this is why Christ Jesus died on the cross for sins. He was buried, resurrected the third day. Christ Jesus come to save you from the hell you deserve to a heaven you don't. That is grace. Let this hand here represent you and I. This wallet here represents our sin. God loves us, hates our, hates our sin, absolutely hates it. And Revelation 21, 20 says, 21, 20 says, says, 21, 27 says, not even a lie shall enter into heaven. We're all born sinners. Romans 5, 12 by one man, sin entered into the world and death was passed on because of sin. And that was given to us. We're born sinners. You are physically going to die because of sin. Cemeteries all around the world are proof that we are sinners. The question is, are you going to die a spiritual death or, or not? Because this is where the righteousness received, obviously seen as righteous as Christ, in Christ. You can deny the redemptive works of Jesus Christ and be like Cain and say, you know what? I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to be like Frank Sinatra and I'm going to do it my way. Well, you know what? You want to do it your way? You're going to go to hell and pay for your sin for all eternity. But let this hand you represent Jesus Christ. God from eternity past revealed himself in the flesh, left his glorification, did not leave his deity, for he is God. Even God says he's God. God the Father calls him God in Hebrews 1 and he went to the cross and only God could die a perfect sacrifice. He became the lamb that Abel had foreseen. They looked to the cross, we looked back. And obviously he died and he rose again the third day, showing us the payment for sin has been paid in full. And when we come to Christ by faith, believe that he died on the cross for sins, buried and rose again the third day, his righteousness is received. We're seen as, as, as free as Christ, justified as Christ, innocent, pardoned, freed, no more a slave to sin. I hope you understand that. Let's go to Romans 11. So Israel rejected the gospel. And we know that their hearts were hardened. Their eyes become dull. Their ears were deaf. Spiritually dumb. And every time you hear the grace message and you reject it, that's when your heart becomes hardened. That's when you become deafer. You become blinder. You become spiritually slumbered. Your heart becomes hardened. And 
And that's what Paul's talking about in, uh, in Acts 28 there. And we read that in Isaiah chapter 6, 9 and 10 last week. Everything that God gave to the Israelites, the nation Israel, they stumbled. And every one of those things was pointing them to Christ. It became a stumbling block to them. But I did learn one thing in Acts 28 there, though. What Paul preached, verse 31. He says, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him, forbidding him. There should never be a message spoken that doesn't preach Christ. We hear it from Paul as he's through the Bible over and over. This Bible is about Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse 12. Now the fall of them, obviously Israel, be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of Gentiles, how much more their fullness. See, in studying Romans 11 here, it is a mistake to read this and apply this to individuals, for we're speaking about two groups. One is the nation Israel, and obviously we're speaking about the other group, the Gentiles. There is a relationship between the two, and obviously God, using the Gentiles, to deliver his plan for the Israel, the nation Israel. Romans 9, we discuss Israel's past. That is this dispensation we're discussing. 10 is obviously Israel's future, and then obviously Romans 11 is Israel's future. And God has a plan for Israel. But it is after the age of grace. Romans 11, 13 and 14. He says, For I speak to you, Gentiles, Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify in my office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation, jealousy them which are my flesh, might save some of them. See, Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles, and he glorifies his ministry to provoke the Jews to salvation and make Jews part of the election of grace. Read, read that in Elijah, uh, Romans 11, 5. He says, even so that at this present time also there are a remnant according to the election of grace. That was in the times of Elijah, 7,000. There's always been a small remnant of Jews saved. And there is a small remnant today. And that was Paul's goal. It was his desire in Romans 9 that he wanted the Jews to be saved. And ultimately by having the Gentiles be saved, that obviously provoked the Jews. What do they have that I don't? And obviously a picture of the light of Jesus Christ in our life. We read Romans eleven fifteen. 15. He says, For if the casting away of them be a reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? The life from the dead. We read the words of casting away in verse 15, fall in verse 11, and diminish in verse 12. And ultimately, we understand this better in verse 17. And I'll tell you, they're lost. They are unbelievers. Again, we see because Israel is rejecting the gospel. The gospel was sent to the Gentiles, and God knew this, and he prophesied about this in the Old Testament. We read that in, in Romans chapter 9, 25, and 26, where Hosea said, My children, well, obviously those people will be my children. I will call them my people that were not my people. But the question is, what is reconciliation? What is reconciliation? It means to bring back in favor. When, when Adam sinned, he obviously broke that fellowship between God and man. It was broken right there. Romans chapter 5, 12, 12 tells us that. And what Jesus Christ does is he reconciles us. He brings us back into favor with God. And it is through Jesus Christ. It is through his hand hanging on God and his hand hanging on man. He is the reconciliation. He is, he is our intercessor. He's our mediator. And it tells us this. This is the answer of what reconciliation is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18, this is what reconciliation is.
and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To know, to wit, is to know that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in God, God, Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness in him. Reconciliation. So we know that we've read in Romans 5.12 that by one man sin had entered into the world and because of sin you will die physically and spiritually if you do not believe in the gospel. By Jesus Christ going to the cross of Calvary and dying on the cross for the sins of mankind, buried, resurrection, the third day, when you believe that, you're trusting in the finished works of Christ, you've been reconciled. You are brought back into favor with God. Just turn back a couple pages in Romans chapter 5. And it tells us our position before we were believers. We were enemies. Verse 5, verse 10, chapter 5, verse 10. He says, For if when you were enemies, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death. And here's again, the scarlet thread of redemption, the gospel that is interwoven through the scriptures over and over. And you'll see these. The more you read, the more you, you see this. And here's the gospel again. By the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, his resurrection. And not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom by we have now received the atonement. He is, he is the propitiation, the satisfied sacrifice. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed on to all men, for that all have sinned. So again, when you read the gospel, we're in, in Romans 5.10, it speaks of his death, his resurrection. Because of this, we receive a joy. We know we have been reconciled. We're no longer enemies to God, but now his son, now his daughter, because anything we have done, because of, it's not because of anything we've done, but because of everything that Christ Jesus has done for us. Turn back to Romans chapter 11. So by the Jews rejecting the gospel, we Gentiles are saved. It went out to us. So the sin be revealed that Christ Jesus oh Christ Jesus is their savior God is declaring here he's not done with the nation Israel one day there will be a great conversion there will be but not until after the rapture happens Romans 11:17 and if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, obviously the Gentile were grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree. And we have churches today that will say the church receives the promises that were given to Abraham, the promises that were given to Israel. That is not true. Those promises will be delivered to Israel. They will, they will happen during the millennial reign. Do not mistake that some preach that the blessings God promised to Israel will be given to the church. That is not so. The promises given to Israel will happen. Branches that are broken off as the nation of Israel has not been believed. They have not believed because they're unbelief. They're not saved. 
tells us that in verse 20. Well, because of unbelief. They've fallen. They've been diminished. They've been cast away. Branches are broken off as the nation Israel has not believed because of their unbelief. They are not saved. During the age of grace, when one believes, again, we're living in the age of grace. We need to remember that. Jew or Gentile get saved. Where do they go? They go to the body of Christ. They go to the body of Christ. It's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the nation Israel, how God has a plan for the nation Israel, and how he uses the Gentiles to deliver this plan. That's what we're talking about here. Because we know in Ephesians, we've read it, where if Jew or Gentile are in the body during the age of Christ, they believe they are in the body of Christ. It doesn't matter, Jew or Gentile. So again, don't make the mistake the, uh, and say the olive tree here is the church, because it is not. Here we see the Gentiles, believers, will be used by God's plan to continue the nation Israel. And we'll see that in a little bit. The root of the tree is the patriarchs of Israel, which is Abraham, and Abraham is the father of faith. How was Abraham saved? Turn back to Romans chapter five, 4. How was Abraham saved? What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? He's gained nothing according to the flesh. For if Abraham were justified by works, he have whereof to glorify, but not before God. See, if Abraham was trusting in his circumcision, or if Abraham was trusting in his sacrifice of Isaac, obviously he was not saved. He says, because you're not going to boast that in front of the Lord. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Galatians 3.8, which I love, is that God gave Abraham the gospel. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. You want that debt? A debt that you cannot pay? Because that's a work. Or you can accept it by faith, which is grace. You don't deserve it, and you freely receive it in him. He says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So back to Romans chapter 11. We know Abraham was saved by faith. That is the root of Israel. But we know today Israel is Judaism. They don't believe in the gospel. Romans 11, 18 through 21. He says, boast not against the branches. Obviously, we Gentiles will sometimes, well, look at us. We must be a special group of people. Obviously, Paul, knowing that the Roman, the Gentiles, he says, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, then thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, and not high-minded, but fear. Do not boast against Israel and think they were broken off for you. They were broken off because they were not believers. They didn't lose their salvation. Again, we're speaking to the nation. Israel, they are, they, as a nation, they are not believers. Are there Jews that are saved? Yes. Do not brag and think you're something special for you're not. Remember, you're a sinner, deserve hell. Remember, it is Christ Jesus who has done all the work. And he's the one who does the saving and all glory goes to him. Do not drift from this, for remember the nation of Israel drift, drifted from the gospel. And the nation of Israel no longer part of the olive tree because of their unbelief, and soon the church will be removed for their unbelief. We see it today. Second, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 3 talks about the apostate church. The church, the body of believers, will be raptured, but that apostate church will continue on into, into revelation there. But we have that a part of the apostate church today. The whore, the harlot, is what's referenced. It is not the body of Christ. They preach a damnable, hell-damning message. And he calls her the harlot, the whore. It's sad, but that is, a works, that is the works message that they preach. It is tickling to man's ears. Romans 11, 22 through 24 he says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, 
shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Speaking of the nation Israel, for if thou were cut off the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to the nature in God in a, into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So again, speaking about the Gentile nations and the nation Israel, not speaking of one person losing salvation in 22, not at all. For one can never lose salvation, but speaking about the nation, the nation Israel will one day have a conversion. They will go into the millennial reign. There will be a resurrection of the nation Israel. They will be reconciled, and they will recognize Jesus Christ as their, as their King of kings, Lord of lords. And there will be a revival of that nation Israel. But not until then. So one day, there will be, they will be grafted back in. How? By believing the gospel. One day Judaism will be disappear and they will be Christians. They will believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has a plan of Israel and the promises God made to Abraham will happen. 25, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, thus you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. There is a fullness for Israel, however, it will not happen until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and the end of the fullness of the Gentiles is the rapture. During the age of grace, are there being Jews saved? Yes. Is the nation Israel? No. So again, speaking about the nation Israel and not individuals. 26. And so all Israel. So here we have a gap theory. Seven years between 25 and 26. Because what does he say? And so shall, and so all Israel. Through the tribulation, Christ Jesus will be revealed. That's what Revelation is all about. They finally recognize he is the Messiah. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall be come, on, come out of Zion the Deliverer, the Redeemer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Obviously not trusting in their works. The fullness of Israel will be at the end of the tribulation. This will be the time they accept Christ Jesus as their Savior as a nation. Will all Jews be saved? No. You're only saved when you believe in the gospel of salvation. Do not trust in your heritage to be saved. Well, I'm the pastor's son. That doesn't matter. Well, I'm the pastor's. doesn't matter. Or my dad was this. Or my grandpa was this. Or well, I'm a Jew. It doesn't matter. Have you trusted in the gospel? That's the only way to heaven. So it says, all of Israel, basically the nation, they will convert from Judaism to true Christianity. 27, 28, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins and concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. So we kind of go back to present day here. But yes, touching the election, they are beloved of their father's sake. The nation today is enemies for the believers, for enemies to the believers, for they do not believe the gospel at this time. However, there will be one day the nation will believe. Are the Jews being saved today? Yes, there are Jews. Are the Jews that are not enemies to, God, uh, to the gospel? Yes, there is. Again, we're not speaking of individuals, but the nation Israel. Israel is a nation does not believe the gospel and enemies. They are enemies to the cross. Just because the nation Israel has rebelled, so 28 here, just because the nation Israel has rebelled and is rebelling and will continue to rebel in the future doesn't mean God will not keep his promises he made with Abraham. I think we can find encouragement in this verse here. Look at 29. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God's gifts to Israel is irrevocable. God can never break a promise. Turn over to Malachi 3.6. Just before Matthew. And you want verses that dispute repentance as turning from sin, feeling sorry for sin, these are two. These, when we get to numbers, I want you to look at that. Because that's what man says today. When they see verses in the, that say uh, repentance, it says, oh, you must turn from your sin, or you must feel sorry for your sin, or there was a penance, you must do something for it. It's like, say, five certain uh, prayers, or 25 of these. But Malachi 3.6, this is for I'm the Lord, I change not. 
Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now turn over to Numbers 23. So well, the thing I want you to see there is that he changes not. Now look at Numbers 23. A great verse for disputing repentance. Twenty-three, nineteen. So we learn that he changes not. Malachi 3, 6. Look at 23, 9. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is the son of man that he should repent. So he doesn't sin. He's not talking about that. Or turn from sin. It means change his mind. Doesn't change, hath he said, or shall he, shall he not do it, or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it of good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He will not change his mind. When God promises, and when he made those promises to, to Abraham, the land, the 225,000 square acres that was promised to Israel, that they never truly embraced or never got, that land will someday be theirs. Not a little sliver in the Middle East. We can find encouragement in that. Because that promise that he gives to Abraham, he gives us another promise. He gives us the promise of eternal life. We can find assurance in this, that God will never change his mind, and we should find confidence in this. For if God promised the things to Israel, and one day he is guaranteeing he will deliver on those promises to Israel, we should find confidence that we, when God says he gives us eternal life, we can never lose our salvation. If God says you have eternal life, he cannot lie. Nor will he ever change his mind. You can find confidence in the word of God that if you believe one time in the finished work of Jesus Christ, you're eternally secure and forever and ever. You will never lose your salvation. Once saved, always saved. A couple verses left. We're almost done. Give me two minutes. Romans 11, 30, 32. For as ye in times past have not believed God, <coughs> yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. We receive mercy through their unbelief. The gospel was sent to the Gentiles. Even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy on them all. Because of the unbelief of Israel in the gospel, the Gentiles are saved. The Gentile nations, obviously, they got to believe. Again, not all Gentiles saved, but Gentiles that believe in the gospel. We're speaking about the nations. Now, through the Gentiles' belief in the gospel, may the nation Israel be saved. Again, not all Jews saved, but the ones that believe in the gospel and the nation Israel one day will believe in Christ Jesus as their Savior. 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath been his counselor? Who hath first given to him? And it shall be repaid, recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. God's plan of salvation for all people show his infinite knowledge and show the riches of his grace. No one gives counsel or advice to the Lord, for he is God, he is all-knowing, and because he is God and knows all things, to him be the glory forever and ever. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we're just so thankful for eternal life when we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and he rose again the third day. And Father, if there's anybody here today that maybe did not understand the gospel or hear the gospel, maybe just they're sitting here today, maybe they're like, you know what, that makes sense. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me and he was buried for me and he rose again for me. I believe that. That person would say, thank you, for he has eternal life, or she has eternal life. They're born again, just like Nicodemus. 
We come to Christ in the dark, and hopefully we leave in the light, that we're born again, that we receive his righteousness, that we're not trusting in our own works like Cain, but trusting in the Messiah, just like Abel, in the finished works of Jesus Christ. They looked to the cross. We looked back to the cross. And Father, as we study here today in Romans 9, 10, and 11, the role of Israel, Israel's past, present, and future, we pray for that nation. We pray for the nation. We pray that you would continue. Obviously, you're the one that's keeping them safe. But we pray for the Jews today. We pray that they would become saved, that there are the Jews, the Jews that we'd share the gospel, that we'd have a desire, that we would share the gospel with the Jews, that we'd share the gospel to other Gentiles that are not saved, that we would have a passion and desire, that we'd be not ashamed of the gospel, that people would hear it, and then they can make a choice. And Father, we pray for the women traveling. Pray for Chris, Carla, Rachel traveling. We just ask for safe travels for them. We pray for the people here in the church. We know there are people that... Uh, uh, are definitely hurting, Father. We just pray that you give them comfort, you keep them pain-free. And to, the, to your children, we just pray that they could find comfort in the everlasting arms, that they would just rest and, and have peace in you. For you're the only one that can give them rest and give them peace. So, Father, we just ask that you be with the people traveling today to keep them safe. And we pray that you would bring everybody back out this Sunday where we can continue to give glory to you forever and forever. For you've done it all. Nobody gives you anything. Nobody counsels you. Nobody tells you anything. You are all knowing, all knowing, and you knew what it took to save people. And it took Jesus Christ to die on the cross for their sins, be buried, and rose again. And we're thank you for this gift, the gift of eternal life that we receive in Christ Jesus. And we know you're the God that can never change. You deliver on all promises, and that is a promise that you've given us. And we're thankful for that. But Father, again, we just ask that you bring us all back this Sunday where we can continue to give glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So grace living, we will do Romans 12. That will continue on grace living. You stand, please stand and turn your hymnals to page 314.